my name is Mo LeMay. I am the new program director of the Aspen Writers Foundation. If I haven't met you, I hope to meet you uh, sometime soon. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, of course, uh, I'm very honored and privileged to be part of this organiz organization that brings the literary arts to Aspen and the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, what a great treat to be part of something like this. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for our program. Um, Winter Words is just concluding this evening. And uh, our sponsors are the Aspen Times, Aspen Public Radio, La Dame de Aspen, and the City of Aspen, as well as Hotel Lenado, Isberry and Rug Company, Barbara Dill Dills, Blanco Liria, and Marcella Larson. Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate it. I also really want to acknowledge all of you that are members of the Aspen Writers Foundation, uh, members of our National Council, our board, and our, um, our staff, because they do so much work. And uh, you make our program possible. Um, Cheryl, <laughs> uh, it's, I think all of us have this strong personal connection to your work. And um, I'm certainly no exception. Um, Dwight Garner in the New York Times Review said that when he read Wild, uh, he was a puddle-eyed cretin. And uh, that's certainly the way I felt when I read your book. Um, and uh, I have these similar sorts of circumstance, this sort of personal connection to your work. Um, I, my mother got cancer when she was in her, in her 40s. And, um, got a diagnosis that she would only live for three months. And I lived through that, um, took care of her through her death. And then a couple years after that, I decided what I needed to do was go on a very long hike. So I hiked the Colorado Trail from Denver to Durango to try to kind of work out my life and um, reinvented myself, I suppose, through that experience. So I feel this kinship uh, to your work. But I know that I am not alone in feeling this pers personal connection to what you've written. There's something so um, brutally honest and irreverent and sensitive and um, tender about what you write. And for me, it opened up floodgates of experience of my own heart and soul uh, reading about uh, your experience. And I know that uh, many of you here have had a similar kind of um, alchemy that it's happened by, through reading your words. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, please give a warm welcome to Cheryl Strayed. And uh, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mo. And I'm so sorry you lost your mom young, too. And I'm so glad that you went on a long hike. Because <laughs> I know that doesn't bring your mother back. It doesn't, it doesn't bring that person back we lost. But it does give us something important. So, so thank you. Um, I'm always amazed. It's true. When Wild first came out a year and a couple weeks ago, um, I started to get this trickle of emails saying essentially what, what Mo said, um, it, you know, in one form or another, uh, which was basically we have, you know, we've lived parallel lives, we have so much in common, and then there would be this long uh, email about all the different things um, that this person has in common with me. And, um, and the trickle became this torrent. And what I realized was, you know, at first those emails, I thought, well, how, how interesting and strange. And then I just realized we, we all have much more in common than any of us ever imagine. And I think we don't imagine it because um, so much of what's true about ourselves is secret or private or at least not visible um, to the eye. Um, we make a lot of assumptions about each other based on things like gender and age and culture and you know just and the, way you, the way you dress. Um, and that's been one of the most 
profoundly gratifying and interesting things um, for me as this work has really had such wide reach, not just here in the US, but really now around the world. Um, I met somebody, um, I was in North Dakota, and this, this Korean woman happened to just be visiting North Dakota, of all places. Um, <laughs> and she said to me at the book signing, she said, uh, you're a celebrity in Korea, we're all reading about you. And I said, really? I had no idea. Um, my, my foreign publishers don't keep me abreast of what's going on with my book there in these different countries. Um, and, she, and I said, well, what are they saying about Wild in Korea? And she said, she told me the different, like three or four things that are being said. And they're the same three or four things that are said about Wild here, which is so amazing and powerful. Because what it means is um, that in this little intimate story about my hike and my grief and the things I did wrong and the things I did right and, and you know, my, my, my searching and, and the, the explorations I went through as a young woman, um, by telling the truth about that, I also ended up telling um, some universal stories. And so that's, that's like the whole mission of memoir. It gets this bad rap for being the, the narcissistic form. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I think that that's, that's, you know, bad memoir is that because the person is telling the story because, um, because they had an interesting experience and, and therefore they think they should write a book about it. Um, and I, I write, I, I teach memoir and I'm always saying, you have to have something more than that. You don't get any points for the living. You have to have a consciousness to bring to bear on the work that has something bigger to say, that undertakes that grand thing that literature undertakes, and that is to illuminate the human condition. And so I didn't, I didn't mean to, to, I got into things before I was able to say thank you for coming and being here tonight. <laughs> it's always really fun for me to come and see a room full of people. So thank you for being here. It's just, it blows me away and it's an honor. So how many of you have read Wild? <laughs> Holy cats, that's so great, thank you. How many have not read Wild? Shame on you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. I'm just always curious because, you know, I'm gonna read a little from the book but I'm mostly gonna talk about it because I think when I come to see a writer, that's what I'm there for, is to really hear this story behind the story and. Um, just some of the, the, the thoughts the writer has about the work. Um, so forgive me if you've already read the book and I repeat stuff you already know and, 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 and if you haven't read the book, if there are a few spoilers along the way. Um, those of you who, who, you know, here this book ha has this hiking boot on the cover and I, I think it's a fantastic cover, really, really sort of metaphorically fitting because um, it is that single boot, that orphan boot. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, I was an orphan. It's a story about, about me being an orphan, too, really. And, uh, but some people uh, bought the book because they thought it was about hiking, you know? <laughs> and, and then they'll be like, holy smokes, you know, it's actually, they're sobbing, you know, um, by chapter one. And, and they're like, they, they didn't know that they were getting into that. Um, and so it is about hiking. I mean, I, I walked 1,100 miles on the Pacific Crest Trail by myself in the summer of 95 when I was 26. And it was really hard and really fun and completely uh, soul shattering and soul building and spirit rejuvenating and life altering. And I do tell that story in Wild. That's absolutely um, told in detail. But the, I think that the, the, the bigger story, um, that thing I was talking about just a moment ago, that reason uh, really for the hike and for telling the story um, begins on March 18th, 1991, when my mom died suddenly of cancer when she was 45. She'd only known she had cancer for seven weeks. And um, she was really um, my only parent. I had my, my father, my biological father was not, uh, didn't love my siblings and I the way um, one hopes a father will, will love his kids. And when he was in my life, he wasn't in my life most of my childhood, but when he was, he was an abusive, violent, tyrannical force. And so when my mom died, and I had a stepfather who I loved very much, but after my mom died, he, he just couldn't continue to be that to me. 
And when she died, it was just as if um, the world ended, the world as I knew it ended, um, the world with my mother in it. And I was a senior in college at the time. Um, my mom was, was also a senior in college, as it happens. I had um, grown up uh, poor and working class in, in Minnesota, most of the time in Minnesota. I was born in Pennsylvania, but um, moved to Minnesota when I was about six. And um, when I, you know, I was always this, from a very young age, five or six, as soon as I could read and write, I was just ferociously obsessed with books, an avid reader, an avid writer. I didn't, it, it, I'd never, it never occurred to me that someone like me could be a writer. Um, I didn't know any writers. I thought of them as dead people. And, <laughs> and so, but I did know that I wanted to, you know, that, that somehow I wanted to throw myself in that direction. And that to me meant getting a college education. Um, nobody talked to me about college, like what you're supposed to do um, to apply for college. And so I started, when I was a senior in high school, I started to get these brochures in the mail. And they, they uh, had, uh, what I did is I lined up these brochures and I looked at the pictures on the cover. And so if any of you work in you know, any kind of like marketing or, or sort of public relations, this, these, these things matter, these brochures. And I, I lined them up and I, and I honestly chose the school that um, had like the nicest looking buildings and the least weird looking people, you know? <laughs> and, and that happened to be the University of St. Thomas, which is this private Catholic college in St. Paul, Minnesota. It never occurred to me I could apply anywhere out of state. And I was also, you know, the college where I really should have applied to, because it was the one I could afford since I was paying my own way, was the University of Minnesota. But it just seemed so big, and I was this kid from the country. I grew up on 40 acres of land, 20 miles from the nearest town, and that town had 400 people. And um, I didn't have indoor plumbing, um, and for part of my teenage years, I didn't have running water or electricity either. And so uh, it was just so intimidating for me to think of going to the Twin Cities and then to go to a huge university on top of it was impossible. So luckily, St. Thomas let me in. The one college I applied to let me in. And when they wrote this letter saying you're in, they said um, one of the benefits if you choose to go here, they didn't know I didn't have a choice, um, one of the benefits is your parents can go for free to take classes for free and your grandparents can take classes for free. And um, my mom read that and said, oh gosh, you know, I've always wanted to go to college. And I immediately laughed because she was 40 and way too old to go to college. <laughs> and also there was no way in hell she was gonna go to college with me. Um, <laughs> Would any of you sign up when you were 17 um, to bring your mom to college with you? <laughs> um, but what happened is time, a few weeks passed, and, and I kept having that, tr that feeling inside of me that the true voice kept saying, ah, you know, my mother has sacrificed everything for me and my siblings, and maybe I could say yes and give her this opportunity. Um, even though the school was three hours away from where we lived. And so I, I, we agreed that she could go to college with me. And I would go and live in the dorm, and she would uh, commute um, three hours. She, would, she got her, all her classes. She, she took a full, full load of classes. And there was one condition, and that was that if we encountered each other on campus, um, <laughs> she could not acknowledge um, that she knew me. <laughs> unless I acknowledged her. So. It was like I was the queen, you know? It'd be like, <laughs> and she was my subject. But, um, and it was, she said, and she totally was so great. And I, I, I look back, I just, I was such a, you know, such a 17 year old. Um, and she said, yeah, I'll do that. And so we did, we went to college that first year together. And, and I did realize St. Thomas was not a quite a good fit for me and too expensive. So I said to my mom, look, I have to, I wanna transfer to the University of Minnesota. And she said, that's fine, I'll transfer too. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> luckily, the University of Minnesota has more than one campus. And so she went to the campus in Duluth, about an hour and a half from where I grew up, and I went to the Twin Cities. And, you know, we were kindred spirits, my mom and I. She was, she was a good mother. And it was when we were seniors that she got sick and died. It was the Monday of our spring break. Friday was her funeral. 
And then I went back to school. Um, my mom had two classes to take before she died. Um, she um, was granted her degree posthumously. The university waived those classes. I had five more classes to take. And I had promised my mother that I would go back, because I, when she got sick, I said, I'm quitting. I'm quitting college, I'm out of here. And she said, please don't let this stop you. Please get your bachelor's degree. So I went back and I took five classes and I did everything I had to do in those weeks right after my mom died. And it was really hard. Um, and, and I walked across the stage and I collected my paper um, bachelor's degree and inside it said, you don't actually have your bachelor's degree um, because I had, I had failed to do one thing in one class. I had failed to write a five page paper in one of my English classes about Nikolai Gogol's short story, The Nose. And they said, just finish that, and then you have your degree. And it was at that point, you know, I walked across the stage, and I got that paper baton. Um, but but if, if, you, if, if I had to, like, physically enact what I was actually doing at that moment when I walked across the stage, it would just be that I, you know, dra like, I crawled and dragged myself across the stage. I was, at that point, just so um, collapsed in my grief that I just was like, you know, fuck you, I'm never gonna finish that paper. <laughs> and I think that that was this moment, you know, that I sort of crossed over. And when I first, when my mom first died, I really tried to grieve her in ways uh, that were noble and that honored her and that in some ways attempted to replace her in our family. And then I found that I couldn't replace her. She was so powerful. I had never known her invisible mother power until she was gone. And um, I didn't have that invisible power. I was the daughter. And so my family sort of disintegrated, essentially. And, and I, in my grief, um, did too, in some ways. I, I really turned my grief inward and uh, became very self-destructive. I was married at the time. I married really young to someone I really loved and who was good to me. And, um, and I did all sorts of things um, you're not supposed to do when you're married, namely having sex with other people, um, <laughs> which doesn't usually go over so great, um, but with the, the spouse. And, um, you know, I, I think in retrospect, it was just like I was, you know, just hungry for, for everything. Um, one of the things that happened in the course of that is I met this man. I, I left um, Minnesota, and my husband and I had broken up at this point, and I went to Portland, Oregon, where I live now, and I met this man who was using heroin. And he said, would you like to try some? And it really, at the time, it seems so silly now. I look back, when I was writing Wild, um, whenever I've written about this experience with heroin, I had, I just shake my head, the older me knows better. But the younger me was searching, <laughs> you know? And in so many ways, the first time I used heroin, it really was this feeling of finally something that works, finally something that, that takes this pain away. There was like this cure for the world without my mom because this whole other world I didn't know existed opened up and it was like planet heroin where it was okay that my mom was dead. And so, you know, I didn't go all the way down the, the deep, dark rabbit hole of addiction, but I was, I was getting there and certainly all the people around me who were using heroin were there. And, um, but my, the man I was married to at the time, my ex-husband, um, pulled me out and I had enough sense to, to, be, to be pulled and returned to Minneapolis. And by then it was about three and a half years after my mother had um, died. And I really was at this place of just the bottom because I recognized how much I had failed um, everything. My, my own, the, the person I was supposed to become, which was, which was actually the person my mother raised me to be. And I think in so many ways, by, by failing to do that, I was, in, I was trying to show the world how much I love my mom. I was trying to honor her by refusing to go on. And I was struck really painfully by the recognition that I had done the, the absolute wrong thing. I'd actually dishonored her. Um, and I'm a mom now, I have two kids, and I know that, that the greatest honor they could give me if I died young would be to thrive, you know, to actually go on. And so 
it was at this moment um, that I was starting to really recognize this. I was, I was at the same time feeling this, this deep despair that I was recognizing that I had to change, um, that something, that my life couldn't just be this. And there was a blizzard um, in Minnesota, like there tends to be awful, well, an awful lot. Um, and I had to, I had a 1979 Chevy Love pickup then, it was called Myrtle, this little pickup I drove around. And I went to REI because I had to dig it out. It was mired in snow. And I, I love that I don't have to tell you guys what REI is. <laughs> you guys know. Um, and I went there to buy a foldable shovel. And I was standing in line waiting to pay for it. And I looked to the side. There was this row of books. And I, just to kill time, picked up one of the books. It had a picture of a snowy peaked mountain with a lake and boulders in the front of it. And, I, and it was called the Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. I had never heard of the PCT before, and I turned the, the, and read that paragraph on the back of the book that said, the PCT is this national scenic trail that goes from Mexico to Canada up the spine of the, up the crest of the Sierra Nevada and the Cascade Range. And I'd never heard, I didn't know a national scenic trail existed. Um, I didn't know, you know, I mean, I, I didn't really know anything about any of this whole business. But the, the paragraph, just that one paragraph. I mean, so many books have changed my li life, um, but that one is really a, who knew this guidebook would be so such a profound um, change for me. I just there was something that blossomed in my, my chest. I guess it was like that inner voice that told me you should let your mom go to college with you. Um, this voice said you should do this thing. Just go, just go and just go walk on this trail. And and I, I really think in in retrospect, I think that really harkens back to um, the way I grew up. I knew that the wilderness was home to me. I knew it was the place I felt the most gathered. I knew that, uh, that, uh, that I could find some sense of peace there. And so I was working as a waitress at the time and writing when I, when I could, when I wasn't having sex with everyone, shooting heroin and stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that doesn't leave a lot of time for writing, but. <laughs> but um, and I saved my money. Every week I'd go into REI with a big wad of cash, my tips, you know, and ones and fives and stuff. And, and I would buy, I would say, I'm going to go for about three months. I'm going to hike as far as I can in about three months. And, and they would say, well, you know, they'd sell me all this cool stuff. You know, REI is so great at that. And, um, <laughs> and then I'd throw in other, you know, because they, so, the, all the, like, camper, backpacker stuff is so damn cute, you know. And so you're like, oh, yeah, I need that too. And um, throwing it in. And so... I did that, and I, I got divorced, and I sold most of my things, and I, and I learned how to um, dehydrate food, and I packed all these resupply boxes that I would mail to myself along the way, and I meticulously planned you know, the, the course I would walk that summer. And I drove to Portland, Oregon, and um, then got myself to Los Angeles, and then to the town of Mojave, California, which is about 10 miles from the trail. And I checked into a motel there, and I and I piled, I was alone, and it was the day I was to begin backpacking. And I piled all that stuff on the bed, the pack, all the stuff I bought. Um, I had never um, packed my pack before. <laughs> um, that was not advisable. Um, and I also, when I was looking at that stuff, I realized in this deep in the bones way, um, that I'd never gone backpacking before either. <laughs> and which is a really profound realization to have um, the day that you're gonna set out on an 1100 mile journey. And so, it, and I did this because, you know, I was, an, I was an avid day hiker. So, I mean, it wasn't as if I'd never gone hiking before. It was that I'd never gone backpacking. And, and I'd done this thing that I do a lot where I, I, kinda, I conflate an easy thing and a, and a hard thing and I sort of make them as if they're the same thing, you know? And so, you know, with day hiking, like you, you wake up, you have brunch, you know, you go, <laughs> right? You go for a walk, you come back, you, you have a Chardonnay and a cheeseburger and some nice pub and um, a micro brew, you know? And, um, and it's like, backpacking is totally not like that. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no brunch on the, on the PCT. And so I was really recognizing this profoundly and I packed the pack. The other thing, I had done is very, very 
uh, without thinking, cavalierly decided where to begin my hike, simply based on where I wanted to end. And then I just traced my finger down the map, added up the miles, how long will, how many miles, you know, what's the distance from the end point, and um, landed at the beginning point in the Mojave Desert. Um, and the reason that that was a mistake that I only realized that morning is, um, you know, I'm from Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. And it turns out there's hardly any lakes in the Mojave Desert. <laughs> and uh, so I had to carry all this water, 24 and a half pounds of water on the first day. So in addition to all the stuff, which was too much stuff, very typical novice backpacker mistake. So here's what happened when I got the pack, all packed and everything that wouldn't fit bungee corded to the outside. And, um, and then the water, the big water balloon dromedary bag attached to the pack. Finally, when everything I was going to carry was in the place that I needed to carry it, a hush came over me. I was ready to begin. I looked at my pack. It was at once enormous and compact, mildly adorable and intimidatingly self-contained. It had an animate quality. In its company, I didn't feel entirely alone. Standing, it came up to my waist. I gripped it and bent to lift it. It wouldn't budge. I squatted and grasped its frame more robustly and tried to lift it again. Again, it did not move, not an inch. I tried to lift it with both of my hands, with my legs braced beneath me, while attempting to wrap it in a bear hug, with all of my might and my breath and my will, with everything in me, and still it would not come. It was exactly like attempting to lift a Volkswagen Beetle. It looked so cute, so ready to be lifted, and yet it was impossible to do. I sat down on the floor beside it and pondered my situation. How could I carry a backpack more than a thousand miles over rugged mountains and waterless deserts if I couldn't even budge in an inch in an air-conditioned motel room? <laughs> the notion was preposterous, and yet I had to lift that pack. It hadn't occurred to me that I wouldn't be able to. I'd simply thought that if I added up all the things I needed in order to go backpacking, it would equal a weight that I could carry. The people at REI, it was true, had mentioned weight rather often in their soliloquies. <laughs> but I hadn't paid attention. I thought about what I might take out of my pack, but each item struck me as either so obviously needed or so in case of emergency necessary that I didn't dare remove it. I would have to try to carry that pack as it was. I scooted over the carpet and situated myself on my rump right in front of my pack, wove my arms through the shoulder straps and clipped the sternum strap across my chest. I took a deep breath and began rocking back and forth, back and forth to gain momentum until finally I hurled myself forward with everything in me and got myself onto my hands and knees. <laughs> my backpack was no longer on the floor. It was officially attached to me. It still seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle, only now it seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle that was parked on my back. I stayed there for a few moments, trying to get my balance. Slowly, I worked my feet beneath me while simultaneously scaling the metal cooling unit with my hands until I was vertical enough that I could do a deadlift. The frame of the pack squeaked as I rose, it too straining from the tremendous weight. By the time I was standing, which is to say hunching in a remotely upright position, <laughs> I was holding the vented metal panel that I'd accidentally ripped loose from the cooling unit. <laughs> I couldn't even begin to reattach it. The place it needed to go was only inches out of my reach, but those inches were entirely out of the question. I propped the panel against the wall, buckled my hip belt, and staggered and swayed around the room. My center of gravity pulled in any direction I so much as leaned. The weight dug, dug painfully into the tops of my shoulders, so I cinched my hip belt tighter and tighter still, trying to balance the burden squeezing my middle so tightly that my flesh ballooned out on either side, which we all know is a really fantastic look. <laughs> my pack rose up like a mantle behind me, towering several inches above my head and, my, and gripped me like a vice all the way down to my tailbone. It felt pretty awful, and yet perhaps this was how it felt to be a backpacker. <laughs> I didn't know. I only knew that it was time to go, so I opened the door and stepped into the light. Thank you. So I didn't know. I didn't know. And um, 
I really did think, well, maybe this is how it's done, and I'm just going to have to get used to it. So I went out there, and um, I, I was immediately schooled. Um, well, you know, let me just quick really, I'll just read a couple of pages of what happened um, when I got out there, and then, and then I'll tell you a, a little bit more about that. So I had to hitchhike. Um, that was the first time I've ever hitchhiked. Um, on the trail, you have to get to the trail, and I, you know, at the, in this town, it was ten miles from the trail. So I, I approached these men, and they looked at me strangely because my pack was so big. And then they dropped me off, and there I was on the side of this lonely highway. I stood by the silent highway after they drove away. Small clouds of dust blew in swirling gusts beneath the glaring noon sun. I was at an elevation of nearly 3,800 feet, surrounded in all directions by beige, barren-looking mountains dotted with clusters of sagebrush, Joshua trees, and waist-high chaparral. I was standing at the western edge of the Mojave Desert and at the southern foot of the Sierra Nevada, the vast mountain range that stretched north for more than 400 miles to Lassen Volcanic National Park, where it connected with the Cascade Range, which extended from Northern California all the way through Oregon and Washington and beyond the Canadian border. Those two mountain ranges would be my world for the next three months, their crest my home. On a fence post beyond the ditch, I spied a palm-sized metal blaze that said Pacific Crest Trail. I was here. I could begin at last. The trail headed east, paralleling the highway for a while, dipping down into rocky, rocky washes and back up again. I'm hiking, I thought. And then I'm hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail. It was this very act of hiking that had been at the heart of my belief that such a trip was a reasonable endeavor. What is hiking but walking, after all? I can walk, I'd argued when Paul had expressed his concern about my never actually having gone backpacking. I walked all the time. I walked for hours on end in my work as a waitress. I walked around the cities I lived in and visited. I walked for pleasure and purpose. All of these things were true. But after about 15 minutes of walking on the PCT, <laughs> it was clear that I had never walked into desert mountains in early June with a pack that weighed significantly more than half of what I did strapped onto my back, which it turns out is not very much like walking at all, <laughs> which in fact resembles walking less than it does hell. <laughs> I panted and sweated, and I began panting and sweating immediately, dust caking my boots and calves as the trail turned north and began to climb rather than undulate. Each step was a toil as I ascended higher and higher still, interrupted only by the occasional short descent, which was not so much a break in the hell as it was a new kind of hell, because I had to brace myself against each step, lest gravity's pull caused me with my tremendous uncontrollable weight to catapult forward and fall. I felt like the pack was not so much attached to me as me to it, like I was a building with limbs, unmoored from my foundation, careening through the wilderness. Have any of you ever carried a pack that ha gave you that feeling? <laughs> Within 40 minutes, the voice inside of my head was screaming, what have I gotten myself into? I tried to ignore it, to hum as I hiked, though humming proved difficult to do, while also panting and moaning in agony, <laughs> and trying to remain hunched in that remotely upright position, while also propelling myself forward when I was a building with legs. So then I tried to simply concentrate on what I heard, my feet thudding against the dry and rocky trail, the brittle leaves and branches of the low-lying bushes. I passed, clattering in the hot wind, but it could not be done. The clamor of what have I gotten myself into was a mighty shout. It could not be drowned out. The only possible distraction was my vigilant search for rattlesnakes. I expected one around every bend, ready to strike. The landscape was made for them, it seemed, and also for mountain lions and wilderness-savvy serial killers. <laughs> but I wasn't thinking of them. It was a deal I'd made with myself months before, and the only thing that allowed me to hike alone. I knew that if I allowed fear to overtake me, my journey was doomed. Fear, to a great extent, is born of a story we tell ourselves. And so I chose to tell myself a different story from the one women are told. I decided I was safe, I was strong, I was brave. Nothing could vanquish me. Insisting on this story was a form of mind control, but for the most part it worked. 
Every time I heard a sound of unknown origin or felt something horrible cohering in my imagination, I pushed it away. I simply did not let myself become afraid. Fear begets fear. Power begets power. I willed myself to beget power, and it wasn't long before I actually wasn't afraid. I was working too hard to be afraid. I took one step and then another, moving along at barely more than a crawl. I hadn't thought that hiking the PCT would be easy. I'd known it would take some getting adjusted. But now that I was out here, I was less sure that I would adjust. Hiking the PCT was different than I imagined. I was different than I imagined. Thank you. So the PCT gave me an opportunity to reimagine myself. Um, I had no other choice. I was schooled by the trail. I went out there um, thinking that, really seeking spiritual rejuvenation and emotional healing. And, and, and the image I had of that was a very uh, sort of, if there were a soundtrack to it, it would be like that nice music that when you're getting a massage, you know? Um, and I just, I imagined that I would be in nature and I would be watching the sunsets and I would be reflecting deeply and I would be thinking how everything was really actually so beautiful. And, um, and what happened is I get out there and really I'm thinking, where the fuck is the water? <laughs> um, and what, you know, it, it's like a lot of curse words and a lot of, um, you know, and, and it was, and it was that I was forced out of the, the head and the heart and into the body. And of course, um, when, you're, when you're forced in that way, it was an incredibly physical endeavor. And when you're forced to do that, of course, all that other stuff ends up happening too. You know, um, every day was full of physical uh, challenge, sometimes actual physical suffering. In fact, lots of times physical suffering. Um, when, when I first went out to the trail, um, the, the first eight days I didn't see another human being. So I was completely, utterly alone for eight days, no human even sighting. <laughs> and that was profound. You know, I could have stopped on day nine and it would have been a lot easier. My book could just be called Eight Days. And, um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, I, the pack was so heavy everywhere it made contact with me. It chafed my skin, it wore my flesh away. My feet were completely screwed from the get-go. Um, I never did have the right boots, and um, I suffered terribly. And, you know, and yet there was that sense of every day being this thing that I had, you know, that this mission that I was on and this, this, this challenge I had to undertake. And the only way to survive it was one step at a time. And I really uh, think that in so many ways in enacting that kind of suffering physically was what ultimately helped me um, come to grips with what I had to emotionally, you know, that world without my mom. Um, the only way to get through any physical trial is uh, by forging ahead and, and thinking in a very you know, in incremental way about that next step or that next mile. Or, you know, I mean, I've given birth naturally to two kids too, and it was that same thing. It was just like this contraction. This is, this is the thing you have to survive. And I think that anyone who loses somebody um, essential to them or has some sort of uh, really life-altering heartbreak. I think that that's the way you survive that too is um, you know one of the things that just still makes my head spin but it really made my head spin then is I'm gonna have to live the rest of my life without my mother. She's actually never gonna be given back to me. That was so unbelievable to me and, and unbearable. And so when I realized that it was just, I had to surrender and say, well, it's always gonna be sad, but I can accept this. I can, I can thrive in spite of it. That, that was a huge shift for me. Um, and when it came to writing the story, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of the people, a lot of people say, well, why did you wait so long to write Wild? You took this hike in 95, and I didn't begin writing it until 2008. And the, reason, the, the answer is I didn't wait. Um, I didn't have anything to say about the story until I, until I wrote Wild. I was, I was ready to write Wild when I could understand um, what that experience meant to me and how it was made manifest in my life as I, as I grew older. Um, and, and it also was through the writing that I discovered that, I, that, I had a, that this story was something that um, could, could be a book. And that scene I read to you, 
uh, about putting on my pack, which is essentially a comic scene. I mean, you guys were, were laughing, and, and it, it makes me laugh, too, when I think about that experience. But, but really, um, when I wrote that scene, it was, that was the point when I recognized that, uh, that I could tap this, this experience um, and, and makes, make it mean something. Um, because it really is um, essentially the situation that, that, we're, that we all face one day or another. We have to bear a weight that we can't bear. And then there we are, you know, we're alone with that pack and the only choice is to, um, you know, to just give up or to lift the pack and, and walk out the door. And so when I wrote that and I, and I could feel in the words, I could feel in the words that that was what that story was really about. That's where Wild really was, was born. Um, and, you know, that, so the hike did end up being transformational. I had no idea when I was writing it. I mean, no idea, none that anyone would say to me that this book was inspiring, that this book inspired them. My feeling about the book as a writer on, from the inside, I really just, um, you know, I, I wanted to just tell as, I wanted to be as raw and open and vulnerable in telling you the story of this experience as possible and then, and then sort of come what may. I didn't have an expectation um, and of, of, of who would be inspired or, or dismayed or whatever emotional reaction they'd have to it. But one of the things that I think is really um, has been interesting to me is that through the experience of so many people reading the book, in some ways the book has been, you know, become, it's been given back to me. Or I guess I see, I can see the story through your eyes in a way that I didn't always see it even through my own when I was writing it. Um, and and that, that has been a, a really kind of cool experience. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot is like, what, what was that aha moment? on the trail, what was the, you know, the big thing, the, the big shift? And the, the real answer is it was, there was no, not one. You know, those of you who read the book know that there were some, there were some days out there that, that felt really emotional, triumphant, or were particularly difficult, or wonderful, or whatever. But really it was the accumulation of the days. It was, the power of the hike was what happened in very subtle and humble ways over time. And keeping faith with, um, the power of sort of forward, mo forward motion every day was what ended up being the thing that felt really significant to me. Um, and, and so I wanted to tell that story, which I think is a truer story of transformation, uh, a subtler story of transformation than that kind of epic, um, you know, Hollywood, you know, she began as like Charles Manson and then she ended and she's the Buddha, you know? <laughs> and um, so, and what I'm so gratified is that so many people have gotten that. So thank you for, for, you know, for receiving my book so generously and, and kindly. Uh, you know, I w would love to go on and talk more. There's so much more to say. But I think that it's, I should open it up to questions because that's always such a fun part of the night when, when I hear what you guys have to say. I can do a quick round of number one question, are my feet okay? <laughs> my, my feet are okay. The toenails did grow back. It took them a few years. So, you know, they, they, they it, but now they're all back and normal. Um, second most common question is, um, how are my siblings and my stepfather and my ex-husband and what do they think of the book and all that stuff? Everyone's okay. They all um, were very supportive of the book. And, you know, not, uh, we, we haven't come back together as a family um, in the, you know, we've never recovered from, as a family. Um, but we love each other, so there's, there's, uh, there's at least that, and I'll take it. I'll take love. Um, and what else? Oh, did I keep a journal? Yes, and that's one thing, that's the one thing I would change about Wild is, is that I did mention my journal a couple times in the book, but, um, but I just decided not to, you know, be like, and then I ate dinner and wrote in my journal. But yeah, I kept a meticulous journal all through my 20s and 30s, and so I had that wonderful resource to draw upon when I was um, you know, Wild is absolutely a, a memoir, meaning that, it, you know, it's my remembrance of this hike, but I also did have that, that document that was very helpful. So those are the kind of three most common questions. So what else do you have for me? If you have a question, please wait for the mic. We'll be running them around. Thank you. So when I was in Boston, while, while the mic is getting to the first questioner, I'll tell you, don't be shy because both the best and the worst question that I've ever been asked has already been asked. And um, <laughs> it was by the same person. Um, 
a man in Boston. Um, I it was like, Wild had just been out a week, so I was new at this kind of thing. It was this time last year. And I opened it for questions, and this man in the front row immediately shot his hand up, and I gratefully called on him. And he said, have you ever had sex in exchange for food? <laughs> and I had to um, repeat the question into the microphone because it was one of those things that nobody could hear it. And this audience was just silent. And, and I was sort of stunned. And, and the only thing I could, I, I just said, no, but have you had dinner yet? And <laughs> he, he had already eaten. So, um, so the answer is still no. Uh, and I'm hoping they'll feed me dinner later. But um, yeah. What do you got for me? Uh, well, quite a prank. That's, that's, right. that's a hard act to follow, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, one thing you said, there's a term in psychology called coping, coping ugly, and it's, it refers to when there's an experience that's so traumatic, so overwhelming, that there's no way to parse it whatsoever. And so sometimes people will do crazy things, even some destructive things, but that's actually considered a legitimate mechanism because at that time, um, if they let it all in, basically the, ner the nervous system would just collapse. I mean, completely, perhaps permanently collapse. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, you know, it's a survival mechanism, coping ugly. But, and I'm just, the question is more like, can you talk about it? Because you've had that, your own, you know, and So coping ugly that. is like being self-destructive, you mean? Well, it does not, yeah, it could be crazy, ugly? acting idiotic, stuff that, that, that's hard to understand. Um, uh -huh. Maybe, you know, being giddy when you should be crying. It could be many, many things. It can be self-destructive. Right. It, it can also just be wild and crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, one of the things that, that when I was writing this book, so I am 44 now. When I first started writing Wild, I was 39. And so I'm looking back at my 26, well, like my, you know, 20, 22 to 26 year old self. And one of the things that I was so struck by, I read the, all my journals, not just from um, the hike itself, but I was, a, like I said, I, I kept journals all through those years. And I was so moved by uh, sort of my own little younger self. Like I, I felt um, like even when I had done the wrong thing or, or had not, um, had agonized over some things like longer than should have, you know, like I was so torn about my marriage, for example. And, and then, you know, from the vantage point of 39, I could see, oh, honey, it's okay. That you were just too young to be married. Like forgive, you know, I, I, I forgave my younger self. You know, and at that and at that time, I, I lambasted myself. I, I had done the wrong things, and I was, you know, what was I, I had lied, and I had, you know, I'd made these mistakes, and I was a stupid idiot, and why did I, you know, I was always, um, my journals are just like this lambast, and then I looked back and read them, and I had all this sympathy. Um, but one of the things that I really saw is everything I did, um, the negative things, what we would say were the negative things, and the po what we would say are the positive things. I was really trying to heal myself. I was really trying to heal myself. I was fighting, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, just wildly to be better, to, 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 to be better. And so when I was able to see that, I was able to have a lot of compassion for myself but, and for everyone, you know? I think that we're all fighting, so there's, I don't know who said, what's that wonderful quote, we're all fighting a, f a fierce battle within, you know? And I certainly was in those years. And so I was coping ugly, but, but, but it ended up being a part of the path. You know? And I think that the trick is, is to not get stuck there in the ugly place. I write a, an advice column um, under the name of Dear Sugar, which is a very unorthodox advice column, not like any kind of normal advice column. And it's always, um, it's always that. It's like, okay, you know, it's, not, it's not terrible that you do terrible things. It's terrible that you get stuck there. You know, and then of course there are other factors. Like I said, you can go down the rabbit hole of addiction, and then it's this whole other epic thing. You know, but I'm so fortunate that that I actually did the hard things I did because it actually led me to uh, places I needed to go. I'm grateful for it all. Thank you. Where's that microphone? Yeah. Hi, I um, loved your book. Thank you. And um, I have a. a a two-question question is, you, you're very honest about your sexuality. How old are your kids, and how do they receive that? Well, they're seven and eight, so they don't receive it at all, thank God. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, and I know what you're getting at here. So this is, yeah, so what's going to happen? It's not like, you know, for their 16th birthdays, I'm going to wrap up my books and be like, happy birthday, time to get to know mommy better. Um, you know, they, I am their mom. I'm there, just like all of us in the room, we got the mom that we got. And our moms did what they did. And I am a writer. And I actually think that, um, you know, there are some things in their teenage years and early 20s that are probably going to be challenging for them about that because they're going to feel like, oh, God, Mom, like, why did you have to write about that, you know? Um, and I think that they won't read my work. Um, they'll probably scan it and be repulsed and then, um, you know, by that sort of stuff, and, and, and rightly so. And then they'll come to it um, when they're mature enough to um, contemplate the notion that I am a human being um, separate from them and a human being who's not only their mom. And I think that we all come to that place. And I don't know any of you, I mean, I would be so, I would feel so lucky to have a book that my parents wrote about who they are. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, it seems like you weren't really on, alone on the trail because of the books you carried. Can you speak to your relationship with those books? The books I carried were so important. Yeah, they were... I mean, books are always my companions, um, but really, really vividly on the trail, you know, because they're one of the, any of you who've ever done long distance hiking know that, you know, a big part of it is it's monotonous and it's tedious and it can be mentally challenging in that regard. And that's why in Wild I write about like also the mixtape radio station in my head where suddenly in that silence, you, you, these things come into your mind that you don't want in your mind, like the, the commercial for Wrigley's double mint gum, remember that? Like in the 70s or something? Suddenly it's like, double pleasure, double, you know, like, remember those twins? Anyway, um, <laughs> and I'm singing it, or the Burger King, you know, have it your way or whatever, and, um, and I'm like, get this out of my head. And, um, and so the books really profoundly also filled that headspace, you know, in, in a bigger way than they do in my life. And so my, my greatest reward was I would get my camp already at night and I would read those books. And then, and then I, as I finished them, I would um, rip the pages and burn them, and which was mortifying at first to me. It was like me, Hitler, and Pol Pot, you know, <laughs> we're, the, we're the book burners. And, um, and and, you know, I'm like, of all people, like, I would be the last person to burn books. But it, w but it was like a sacred act. I needed to lighten my load. And I think all those writers, um, forgive me. I, I, I don't know. I, a lot of people have written to me and said, I, oh, I was out backpacking and I had your book and I almost burned it, but I couldn't. And so I'm like, <laughs> I'm waiting for that first report of somebody burning my book. <laughs> have any of you burned my book? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I'd be so honored. Hi, Cheryl. Um, I got a chance to already hear you once this year when I was in Mexico. Oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> oh, are you Jody back there? Yeah, that's me. Hi. You're in the, in the lights. I can't see you. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> um, and I asked a question there that everybody loves, so I'm going to ask it here. Um, can you tell us about your experience with meeting Oprah and Reese Witherspoon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. So I, it was last year on like April... I think 16th or nine, right, right, just very much almost exactly a year ago. I was on my book tour, the hardback tour for Wild, and I was in a hotel room in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was about lunchtime, and my cell phone rang, this, this cell phone right here. <laughs> Ding! And I didn't recognize the number, so I almost didn't pick it up, and then I just sort of annoyed, thought, well, I better just dispense with this. And I picked it up, and I said, this is Cheryl, and she said, this is Oprah. And I paused, and I said, it is. <laughs> and she laughed, and I was like, what do you want? I mean, you know, it was like, <laughs> and um, she had just finished reading Wild, and um, she just gushed about the book and went on and on and on about how she loved it. And um, we talked for like 20 minutes about the book, and I kept interrupting her because I kept like shrieking and saying like, are you kidding me? Are you calling me? And she'd be like, I'm calling you. So um, she said, I have this idea. I would like to restart my book club for this book because I just want everyone to read it. What do you think about that? 
And I said, I thought that was fine. Um, <laughs> well, that sounded like a good idea. And she said, well, you know, I looked on your website, which just cracks me up. I do my own website myself. I am, like, I know nothing about web design. I just, you know, update it myself and all this stuff. And she, so I could just imagine Oprah sitting there in her pajamas going onto my website. <laughs> and she said, I see you're going to be in LA this, this weekend doing an event on Saturday. How about you come to my place? On Sunday, um, she has a place in Santa Barbara. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I went, I found myself uh, just a few, n few days later um, at Oprah Winfrey's beautiful place, um, sitting under the redwood trees in her front yard, um, talking to her. They, we, we shot this two hour show for her. It's on her own network. It's called Super Soul Sunday. It's actually going to be rebroadcast on Sunday, this Sunday. Um, it's noon Eastern time. Um, I mean, check the schedule if you want to see it, but it's this two-hour show where she did this, we had this long conversation all about the book, and then they came to uh, Mount Hood and shot me like on the trail and interviewed me more, and, um, and it was just really amazing, and she was such a great person. She, I, I was so struck by, I mean, she just acted like the, the pleasure was all hers, the honor was all hers to talk to me, and she's so smart. She really understood the book in all those ways. One hopes you understand, and one understands your book. And, and so she, she just had this wonderful generosity of spirit that I think um, you would expect from Oprah. And, and I just, we grew a friendship from that. We're, we're, we're friends. A uh, Oprah and I were texting each other last night, actually. Um, and she's, she's somebody who sort of, um, I was so humbled, too, to just contemplate how far she came on her own hard work you know, she's just amazing. So I feel lucky. And what, what with the torture thing, though, was, um, so I had to wait for, so this was late April, and then she didn't make her announcement till June 1st. So I had, and there was this, like, you have to not say anything to anyone about it. So I could tell my husband, but no one else. And, you know, my editor and my publisher people, like, found out after. I mean, she told me first, I told them. And, and then there was this whole thing that had to be done to get the book club ready to go. And so I had to just be silent about it because Oprah wanted to make the announcement. And um, it got to the point where I was just about to like die of this secret. And when I was at Oprah's house, she'd, it was cold and she gave me a sweater and she said, oh, you can keep it. And of course, um, I like didn't take it off for like six weeks. <laughs> and it was this cashmere sweater and I'd be like petting it, you know? Um, and people would be like, you know, because be, they'd be like, nice sweater. And I'd be like, thank you. Um, anyway, and she also sent me a blanket, this really soft blanket, and I wouldn't let my kids, it's still in a box at my house because I have three cats and two kids, and I'm like, somebody's going to puke on this the minute I take it out of the box. <laughs> but every once in a while we take it out, and my kids will go, can we cuddle under the Oprah blanket? <laughs> and um, so anyway, so Reese also, so Reese Witherspoon optioned, um, well, before it came out actually, she read it a few months before it came out, and she had that same reaction that, that Oprah had. She just really got the book and was very perceptive about it, and so she's going to um, make a movie uh, starring uh, in the role of Cheryl Strayed, and, um, which is totally fucking bizarre. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, Nick, Nick Hornby, the wonderful writer Nick Hornby, wrote the script, and I've read it, and it's great, and things are rolling. Um, so... It's very exciting. So, listen, I'll be signing books, um, and I just thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's just a great pleasure to be in the room with you, and happy trails, everyone. Thank you, Joe.